please welcome to the stage Vice President of Environment, Policy, and Social Initiatives, Apple, Lisa Jackson, and President and CEO, WWF, Carter Roberts. I think we are last on the day for you guys, and we really appreciate your being here. We are at a moment, at least for WWF, where we have been working in the world of conserving nature for 60 years. And we have gotten to the point now where we see very clearly that nature is fundamental for human health, it's fundamental for security and stability in the world, it is fundamental to the global economy, and it is also fundamental to climate change and to solving climate change and building resilience with communities. And I could not be more delighted to be here on stage with somebody who occupies a significant role in the environmental movement, first as a, uh, an amazing head of the Environmental Protection Agency during the Obama administration, and more recently as the head of sustainability at a tiny little company called Apple. And uh, Lisa Jackson has made a huge difference in so many ways in the world, and it is my great pleasure to be here talking to Lisa in front of all of you. Oh, thank, thank you. you, and thank you for your work. Thank you. So, um, Lisa, you have had quite a career, <laughs> and you have occupied two of the most significant positions in the world of environment, sustainability, one as a regulator, and a very significant one. Just as a side note, my organization has had four presidents in its entire history. Two of them were the administrators for the Environmental Protection Agency, right. Russell Train and Bill Riley. And I have grown up admiring so much the role of the EPA and the central role of the EPA in America and its response to pollution, mm. to climate change in so many areas. And now, not now, but for quite some time you have been at Apple, innovating throughout Apple's, um, all, all aspects of the business and driving sustainability. So my question is this, you've been a regulator, you've been a leader in the private sector, could you just talk about the, uh, the difference in the two roles that you've had and the role of the private sector, the voluntary initiatives that you have undertaken, and the role they play in a complex regulatory environment in which you operate? Yeah, I'm happy to. And thanks to everybody for hanging in today, and thank you for the work of WWF and for making it for so many years, so tangible to so many people, because people respond to places. So much of environmental protection is place-based and nature-based. Um, so look, I, I'm, a, I'm a regulator. I, I was 25 years at the EPA, so I'm two to one pu public sector to private sector, almost, maybe a little more. Um, and I believe strongly in the, in the role of regulation, in the uh, idea that equity, justice, health, um, rely on somebody who's going to enforce the incredibly important regulations around air and water and land and pesticides and toxics and um, all the things that EPA is tasked to do under law. Um, and you know, I started my career in the Superfund program and one of the things that I always tell people is the Superfund program back in the 80s, when I started, it, it, it continues to be an incredibly frontline community. You're, you're meeting with people who are the front line of when that doesn't go well. And they're angry, and they've lost any belief in who's supposed to protect them. Sometimes they're angry at their local government. They're certainly potentially angry at the federal government. Um, and you have to go in and help people you have to meet them where they are and help them realize how 
uh, important it is that their voice be heard as part of the, prop of the challenge. So I say all that to say that I don't think anything stands in the, uh, at, at the same tier as regulation. Uh, people don't like to hear that. They want to believe that, oh, why can't we all just do this in completely in a voluntary manner? But somewhere there has to be a floor. And somewhere for companies who are stepping up to do more, to do things that they aren't required to do by law, they shouldn't be at a disadvantage because another company isn't even doing the minimum. Right. So there has to be a, a level playing field, and that's economic fairness, but it's also just justice. Yep. Um, now we move to the voluntary side. I mean, the first time I ever saw um, or, or interacted much with Apple was really in a voluntary program. I didn't do a lot with them at EPA. Um, but I think it's incredibly important for leadership companies, companies that want to be known as a leader in the space of the environment, set themselves up with values and goals that go far beyond what the floor is. Um, and especially because so much of our environmental law and the practice is based on technology and innovation. So I can't regulate it at EPA if it hasn't been proven to work somewhere out in the world. And most of those innovations still come in our system from private sector investment and catal you know, cat being catalyzed by um, the sector. So we don't, we don't just go out and say, you know, you should be able to get mercury down to 0.1 part per million. We don't know how, go figure it out. We don't, we wait until the technology tells us you know, where we can go because the law is based on best available technology. So the two go together. When it comes to nature, I am incredibly passionate about our role at Apple in ensuring that that part of our carbon footprint, where we do decide to use nature-based removal to address carbon, and there's about 25% of our footprint, which in order to get to our 2030 goal, we have to do some removal, um, that those, pro those, those projects be incredibly high quality, that there's great MRV, but also that there's a community element, that we're looking at how it impacts the community and what that says to them as well. Great. I, 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 you all know the innovation that Apple does in terms of pro product design, um, all the amazing things that your products do and how they've changed their lives, but it is also true that you are on the front lines of innovating at the intersection of nature and climate. Hmm. And for us at WWF, it is clear that, increasingly clear, that nature and climate are all bound up together. I often talk about it that they are like the two strands of a helix wound up together. You can't solve climate change without conserving or restoring nature. And by, in reverse, you can't save nature without solving climate change. They go together. And I always go back, the World Economic Forum lists the top 10 threats to the global economy. Hmm. And they list those each year in their report, the current threats and then the future threats. And on the threats over the next 10 years, five of the top six relate to climate hmm. or nature. Hmm. Loss of nature, increasing climate change. And so for us, this is profoundly important. You, Apple, has been an early investor in a nature-based solutions origination platform mm -hmm. that we have built. And it is nature-based solutions is, for me, the coin of the realm where these worlds come together. And a nature-based solution is an investment in projects on the ground that solve climate change, reduce emissions, build resilience. And you were an early investor in that program and making a huge difference with us and other institutions. And I'd love for you to just talk about why is that important to you? And what have you learned along the way about nature-based solutions in your work? Yeah, happy to. I, um, it's actually somewhat ironic, right? We're a technology company and so we are constantly interested in innovations on the technology side. New materials, recycled materials, you know, we're down to the very last little bit of plastic in our packaging, new films, new dyes, new coatings to get plastic out of our packaging, all kinds of fun uh, 
innovations, and I'm an engineer by training, so that stuff really geeks me out. But on the other side, when we looked across all of our engineers, all of our thought at the time we made the pledge back in 2020, and we said, where's the proven technology? It was actually nature. We know what nature does for the planet. We know that you know, forests are the lungs of the planet, that they breathe, that they absorb many of the ills, and especially carbon dioxide that we put into the, the atmosphere, that this planet that we're living on is this incredibly balanced system. We know how important biodiversity is. And in general, it's hard for a company that's not relying on biodiversity for its work to say, oh, well, I should be funding biodiversity. But if you're funding nature-based solutions, you can find those that are clean water solutions, that are biodiversity solutions, that are forestry solutions, that are employment solutions, that create jobs or at least support livelihoods which already um, rely on an ecosystem. And that give you the opportunity to work with communities as well. So um, I always tease people that, you know, I'm an environmentalist not because of nature. I grew up in the city. I am a city girl. Um, uh, you're not going to get me all excited about the environment because of nature, but you're going to get me really excited when I look at people's place in that I'll use that, that DNA strand of nature and climate and environment together. Those are the places where I think it's really fun for us to work. It's difficult, but super important. Um, and so when we, when we decided that the big technology move for us would be nature, what we really knew the innovation would be in how to invest in a way that would be appealing to businesses, especially those in our supply chain, uh, so we came up with the Restore Fund, which is uh, a fund where you invest a um, dollar and the return is more than a dollar in cash, but also carbon removal. Uh, and the Restore Fund's removing a million tons a year of carbon. We're constantly uh, working to ensure high quality projects and to try to improve the state of the art on measuring and reporting and verification on those projects. I will not argue that we're at perfection on MRV, but I don't think we should throw out um, projects because we're not quite where we want to be. And I think technology will help us uh, there as well. And I think we have great high quality projects and we're very picky about them. We've turned down a lot of them. So we've, we've been in the fund for several years now and this past year um, we had two of our suppliers join us in the Restore Fund. So it's actually a way that appeals to business to look at investing in nature in a way that also um, gives a benefit um, financially, but also for carbon removal, which everybody's looking for right now. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. I, um, you are a co-chair of America is All In. And WWF was one of the co-founders of America is All In. We did that at a time when um, America's engagement in the Paris Agreement was in question, and now it has broadened and deepened to include mayors, governors, companies, people, and faith-based leaders, and so many different institutions that cover two-thirds of the American economy and two-thirds of the American population. And I as co-chair of that, I'd just love for you to reflect on why is that so important? Why the breadth of it, the diversity of America is all in, why is that so important? Why did you agree to be the co-chair of this broad, diverse coalition and initiative? It's, it's, it's too important. The moment that we're in is one where people are trying to divide us by in issues by segments, you know, corporate versus public versus advocacy versus, you mentioned faith-based groups versus local government versus um, federal government. And when people ask me which one, I say yes. Absolutely every one, because this is about a democracy. And a functioning democracy is about making your voice heard. And whether that's, you know, sitting where I do today, which is, we do tons of work on policy at Apple because it would make my life much easier if all we had to do was say, I'll take the green power, please, 
And can all my suppliers also run on the green power around the world? So we're really proud of the fact that we can work with our suppliers and go into their governments and say, hey, this would be a great thing for us to be able to access because Apple would like it. But then domestically, the same thing, to be able to help support those entrepreneurs who are trying to be a part of the green economy or those entrepreneurs who are saying, hey, you want a circular economy? I'd like to be a part of that as well. We're in a moment now where you know the funds from IRA are starting to hit the country. And if you look at where those funds are going, we should be making lots and lots of businesses and lots of places who maybe haven't seen the benefits of the green economy, of um, all that people are trying to do, of nature-based solutions. They haven't, they haven't seen it. But nothing, nothing illustrates that like a job, like livelihood, yeah. like economic um, development. And it, they go together just as much as, um, as anything else. So look, when I was a regulator, the most important moments were when we found those solutions that were win and win and win, that, that had positives for the planet, positives for people, and positives for the companies as well. And the smartest companies were always trying to stay one he step ahead of that, right. maybe even make a dollar or two, right? Um, and so I think that is part of what this is about. For me as in the private sector now, it's saying, let's, you can be a company like Apple, and um, you know, it's not our main business, but being aware of and planning for and doing right by the planet is part of how we intend to continue to be a leader. The expectations of consumers, partners, suppliers, all of that looms large in all that you do. And I've always believed that there is a virtuous cycle, that when a company does good things and does them the right way, mm and does the right thing, and all that it does, it plays back to that company. It pays it back in various ways. And I've also learned that companies are full, I, I started off in the private sector, companies are full of people who care about their communities, care about their families, and all of that. Um, I wanna ask you one last question, and it is this. Um, I. I have three kids who just graduated, two just graduated from college. Oh, congrats. One works in the Department of Energy's loan program with Jigger Shaw on moving the IRA money. Nice. They're all in the business. One works with farmers in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, no. and the other one works on ESG standards. And my wife and I think a lot about how do you raise kids, how do you, um, what kind of careers might they have? My wife, by the way, is also an engineer. Hmm. Her first job after graduate school was a young person in the Environmental Protection Agency. And the first thing she worked on was the Superfund site oh, wow. in New Amazing. Bedford Harbor. Oh, New Bedford, wow. wow. And so, um, wow. and just one thing I've learned about engineers, hmm is their problem solvers. And she was a chemical engineer, Me and too. that was what she cared the most about, was solving problems. You were in a position where I bet people, young people ask you all the time for advice on their careers. And um, I'm just interested, when you, what, what do you tell them about the choices they make, the skills they acquire, and how they can make the greatest difference in the world. Well, my, my sons aren't here, so I can talk about them because they won't, you know, get mad at me. Um, look, they're 10 years long, right? They're 28, 29, and, you know, I, a couple things. The first thing I say is if you are at a point where you're trying to pick your major, whenever I can, I'll, I'll meet folks who say, I really want to do policy. And I say, great, do science. Because you know, people forget how incredibly complex, technically complex, a lot of these issues are. We talk in the jargon all day long, but one of the first things Tim Cook said to me, my current boss, the CEO of Apple, um, when I was interviewing, which is a whole nother long story, he said, I like that you're an engineer. Because in order to change people's minds, they know you understand at least some of, I'm a chemist, these are electrical engineers, you know, they're a whole different world, but 
They understand we think the same way. If you give me a problem, I'm going to attack it the same way they do. So you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be an engineer. If you're asking me environmental science versus environmental policy science, if you can, if it's of interest to you, if, it, you, know, if you have the aptitude for it. Um, but then I also say you don't have to be environmental anything. I was a chemical engineer. I was trained by Tulane University at the time to be an oil and gas engineer, petrochemicals. That's what's down there. That's what's in New Orleans where I grew up. And yet in that world, I became exposed to and understood, you know, off the chart, you always, the waste just goes off the chart. No one asked where it was going until Superfund came along. And suddenly it became clear it went to communities, yeah. right? And, or it went into the air, it vented, as we say, or it went into the water. It was disposed of in, the, in a river, usually. Um, so you don't have to be, you don't need environmental in front of your name in order to do that work. And then the next thing is to get really good at a couple of things. You know, I worked, I started my career as a staff level engineer at the EPA in Washington, D.C. I was lucky enough that for personal reasons, I ended up moving to our office in New York where I got to work much closer. You know, I started doing policy and I had never really worked in the program. So then I got to move and do the work. Uh, and eventually I went to the state level where you're even closer to the work. Um, and so I just think you have to grind. What I tell my sons now is you just need to grind for 10 years and learn something. Because whatever they taught you in school, you're about to yeah. learn what's really happening. Uh, last is, I don't think we have to give young people anything. They are incredibly impressive. Uh, they're impatient, they're smart, they're better networked. They understand the levers of communication as power in a very different way. Um, so what we need to do is also be willing, um, I won't say step aside, but to make sure we're bringing them along so that we can step aside. Um, because, you know, the sooner they're given a chance to get in there and lead, I think it will be better for the planet as well. You heard it here. <laughs> Grind away Grind. and then wait for the rest of us to step aside. <laughs> but it is uh, one thing I have learned in the very first trips I took to Silicon Valley. My expectation, people's expectation, a long time ago was that you'd go there and you could raise a lot of money. And it became quickly clear to me that you go to Silicon Valley not to raise money, but because it's full of engineers and it's full of problem solvers. It is full of people who, if you just put a problem on the table, they will look at all kinds of innovations and all kinds of ways to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And in and, and doing so sets the stage for the right kind of policies, the right kind of regulatory frameworks, I, I wanted to thank you for all the work you do. Thank you. Both in solving problems, setting the stage for the right kind of policies, oh, regulatory you. frameworks, but also giving such great advice on both, you're right, we don't need to give young people a lot of direction. They are on fire much more than we were about solving the issues that we see in the world. Well, and if you are in Silicon Valley, I have to just give you, it is really important, that other piece, which is to listen. Yes. Um, we are smart, we're so smart, but communities know what they need as well. And so if you design an answer in a vacuum away from the community that's impacted and away from the people who have to live with it and use it, it's not going to be a solution. And that has been the problem for sustainability for far too long. People felt left out of the solutioning and therefore of the benefits. And until this, and back to America is all in, until we're all part of the solution and we all see it, then it's not gonna work. You're right. The environmental community at our worst, we have a tool and we wanna go use it. At our best, we're responding to the needs and the knowledge and the wisdom and experience of communities. So um, I want you all to join me in thanking Lisa Jackson for being with us Thank you. tonight. Thank you Have so a much. wonderful climate week, everybody. Thank you.